Good night for all those who are watching us. I'm here again with my friend Reginald Libert. We're going to talk about the patriarchal blessing of Lorenzo Snow, the president of the church. It's good to have you, Reggie. Hey, it's good to be here. Welcome. Okay, so as an introduction, we will discuss the blessing of Lorenzo Snow. He was born on April 3rd, 1814 in Mantua, Ohio, in the United States. His parents were Oliver Snow and Rosetta L. Pettibone. He died on October 10th, 1901, aged 87 years old, in Salt Lake City, Utah, in the United States. He was president of the church from September 13th, 1898 to October 10th, 1901, for a total of three years and one month. Some key facts about him. He was the fifth president of the church. He implemented the church white tithing and he formalized the succession policy in the church for the presence of the church. His blessing was given by Joseph Smith Sr., born on July 12, 1771, in Topsfield, Massachusetts Bay. His parents were Isaiah Smith and Mary Dewey. He died on September 14, 1840, aged 69 years of age, in Alvo, Illinois, in the United States. He served as a patriarch from December 18th, 1833, up until his death on September 14th, 1840, for a total of six years and eight months. He was the first presiding patriarch, and he was also assistant counselor in the First Presidency. The blessing was given on December 15th, 1836, and the content that we're using is primarily based on the Patriarchal Blessing Book number one of the Church. Okay. Would you like to read this, the first yep. page? So, the, to introduce the blessing, it, was, it said that at a patriarchal blessing meeting held in the Lord's house in Kirtland, this 15th day of December, 1836, Joseph Smith Sr., the patriarch of the Church of Latter-day Saints, being present and holding the meeting, a patriarchal blessing was conferred on the head of Lorenzo Snow, son of Oliver Snow, born in Mantua, Portage County, state of Ohio, the 3rd of April, 1814. And so, yeah, this was likely not part of the blessing, something added when it's recorded. This is just, yeah, it's just an intro to, to what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then the blessing continues, it says, Brother Snow, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the authority of the holy priesthood, which God has conferred on me, and by the holy anointing, I lay my hands on thy head and give thee a father's blessing. So the first reference that I have here that I thought it would be interesting to talk about is this holy anointing that Joseph Smith Sr. is talking about. So this, there's a short excerpt here. It says, When the house of the Lord, as the early saints called the Kirtland Temple, was nearing completion, Joseph convened the preparation meetings in the rooms of its third floor garret on the evening of January 21st, 1836. There, in the westernmost room, Joseph met with his secretary, other members of the First Presidency, his father, the Church's Patriarch, and the bishoprics from Missouri, Ohio. The brethren came to the meeting freshly bathed, symbolizing their efforts to repent and present themselves sanctified before the Lord. The First Presidency consecrated oil, then anointed and blessed Father Smith, who in turn anointed and blessed Joseph. Then the heavens opened. Oliver Cowdery wrote that the glorious scene is too great to be described. I only say that the heavens were opened to many, and great and marvelous things were shown. Bishop Edward Partridge affirmed that some of the brethren saw visions, and others was bl were blessed with the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So what can you tell us about this anointing ceremony, Reggie? So this here seems to be the case where, where Joseph Smith Sr. was set apart in, as we would say today, set apart into the calling of the patriarch and, and anointed and ordained to that office of the priesthood. And it seems that there was a little bit, it was especially special as this is the first time that that office was in a sense being restored to the church. And so this is the anointing that was received which gives him the authority to, to act as, as, in a, as, as a father to the church, as a patriarch to the church. And one of these important blessings, one of the important roles of being a patriarch is the ability to give these fathers blessings much as much as in the book of Genesis we have Jacob giving blessings to his children as as we as the, the roles from Adam down through Enoch now down through Abraham 
we're all given this this role to be like a patriarch, be a father, and pass these blessings onwards. This anointing gave this the same role to Joseph Smith Sr., to be a patriarch, to be the one designated to to deliver the blessings that God has for his children down down to them through the patriarch blessing. Excellent. And as members of the church, what does the, the anointing prepare us to? Well, the, there's a few different directions we can go with this. Uh-huh. And so, so in one sense, this anointing with oil is a symbol relating to the to the anointing to the anointing of royal that, that was traditionally done for royalty, to the anointing of being either a priest or or of perhaps a king, and this is an an anointing in a sense to to receiving those kinds of roles in the kingdom of God as a preparation for for that. Thank you. And the blessing continues. I ask God, the Eternal Father, who has called me to the office of the priesthood, to open the visions of my mind and give me the Holy Spirit. I ask him to, ve- to have mercy on thee, who art but a youth. Thou hast been diligent and ardent in thy application to thy learning. God has looked upon thee from all eternity, has been propitious, has been bountiful in his gifts. He has given thee intelligence, talent, and great faculties of mind, that thou mightest be useful in his cause. Yeah, so here's a, a story from, a story or, or an excerpt from the life of, of Lorenzo Snell, which will discuss, discuss a little bit about these, this intelligence and talent that he has. And so it says, when young, young Lorenzo Snow was not doing his chores on the family farm, he was usually reading, hit up with his book, as family members would say. According to his sister Eliza, he was ever a student at home as well as in school. His love of learning increased as he grew up. In fact, he said that education was the leading star of his youth. After attending public schools, he studied at Oberlin College, a private school in the state of Ohio in 1835. In 1836, before he joined the church, he accepted Eliza's invitation to move to Kirtland, Ohio, where he studied Hebrew in a class that included the prophet Joseph Smith and many of the apostles. Yeah, isn't that an amazing thing? That his uh, interest in education was what led him to meet the early members of the church. Yes, it's... It's, I always like hearing these stories about these people who really focused on their education, focused on their intelligence. As I am a bit of an I'm an academic myself, so that's kind of what I relate towards. And I find it interesting how God used used this this propensity of His to lead him to Kirtland, where he could where he could learn and where he met the Prophet Joseph Smith and eventually joined the church and received these blessings. Absolutely, and in the early 19th uh, leaders of the church, Lorenzo Snow was the only one who had gone beyond what we have what we call the high school nowadays he was the only one who had attended college and and that certainly was very important for him to conduct his administration of of the church certainly was he was definitely an intelligent person and that was taking the level of education he received was was exceptional for the period unusual for the period of time in which he lived absolutely and it says, Thou has a great work to do in thy day and generation. And the comment that I have here was that Lorenzo Snow was ordained an apostle in 1849. He became the fifth president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1898. Although president only three years, he rescued the church from financial ruin by urging the saints to live the law of tithing. So clearly he had a very important mission as president of the church. This was a turning point in church history. If I remember my history correctly, this is the last time that the church was in debt, and it was heavily in debt and struggling financially. But since then, the church, both, both through both through the grace of its members in, in obeying the law of tithing and through the, the management of the, of the money and the, uh, uh, that the church has done, the church has been financially well off since and has saved some away, and that's what allows, it, allows the church to do as many great and wonderful things for the world as it does today through the welfare and the humanitarian programs. Absolutely. Not, not to mention the, the multitude of temples and meeting houses and church facilities and church activities that go on throughout the world. Mm-hmm. Certainly. And, you know, talking about this this experience of him uh, introducing the law of tithing as we know today, the 10% of your income, 
uh, I remember what I was reading about this story and the, there was a drought in the region of Utah back in these days and the, the saints were not producing enough um, to sustain themselves and I remember that President Snow he went and he visited the, the members and he said that if they obey the law of tithing the Lord will pour out the rain again and shortly after they he implemented this policy of, of the law of tithing and members were complying shortly after the rains came back to Utah and the saints were, be able, were able to to come back to their usual level of um, of production in terms of agriculture and cattle so it was it was a, a demand but at the same time a blessing oh it's always been a blessing I mean you look at the stories of tithing from both the early church and from nowadays and even you just talk to other members of the church and about their experiences and tithing is so much more than than just a gift of money it's really does pour out the blessings of heaven yeah thank you Reggie and the blessing continues God has called thee to the ministry thou must preach the gospel of thy Savior to the inhabitants of the earth and I have here this comment on some of the missions that he served. A great missionary, he preached in the southern states, England, Italy, Switzerland, Holland, Malta, India, and Hawaii. As president of the church, he expanded the missionary program, opening fields of labor as far away as Japan. So it was really a fulfillment of, of the blessing that he must preach the gospel of the Savior to all inhabitants of the earth. And he's, he served himself in, in, in these regions as also expanding this missionary program. Yep. He, this part of the blessing was certainly fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And the blessing continues to say that thou shalt that say to him that thou shalt become a mighty man in the earth. And so as a description of this we have from the history of the church as described by B. H. Roberts. President Snow was in manners elegant, refined, and gentle persuasive but forceful, and it was said of him that he could say and do the hardest things in the gentlest, quietest manner possible to man. No man among his frontier and pioneer associates could endure more physical hardships or sustain more prolonged and intense mental exertion than he could. He possessed a keen business instinct as well as a highly sensitive spiritual nature. Truly really was a mighty man. Absolutely. And the blessing continues, Thou shalt have a great faith, even like that of the brother of Jared. Now let's take a look at this story of the brother of Jared on Ether chapter 3. Let me see if I have this. Okay, I have it. So, okay. verses 7 through 13. And the Lord saw that the brother of Jer Jared had fallen to the earth. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, why hast thou fallen? And he saith unto the Lord, I saw the finger of the Lord, and I feared lest he should smite me, for I knew not that the Lord had flesh and blood. And the Lord said unto him, Because of thy faith thou hast seen that I shall take upon me flesh and blood, and never has man before me with such great exceeding faith as thou hast. For were it not so, he could not have seen my finger. Sawest thou more than this? And he answered, Nay, Lord, show thyself unto me. And the Lord said unto him, Believest thou the words which I shall speak? And he answered, Yea, Lord, I know that thou speakest the truth, for thou art the God of truth, and, can, and canst not lie. And when he had said these words, behold, the Lord showed himself unto him, and said, because thou knowest these things, ye are redeemed from the fall, before ye are brought back into my presence. Therefore I show myself unto you. The brother of Jared has long been put forward as like one of the great examples of faith because of this selection of scripture describing how great his faith was to see the Lord Jesus Christ before like as as a as a heavenly being. And yet we see many other examples throughout the scriptures and throughout church history of of people who have been blessed to with the same level of faith to see see Christ we 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 have Moses Nephi Peter 
um, Joseph Smith, and and we'll talk a, bit, a little bit later about Lorenzo Snow having ex an experience to see Jesus Christ in the flesh. Absolutely. And there is now a mighty part of the blessing. It says, Thou shalt have the power to translate thyself from one planet to another, power to go to the moon if thou shalt desire it. And I have selected here this uh, teaching of the book, Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, and, it's, and the Prophet Joseph is explaining the role of translated beings. And, and the Prophet teaches, Many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately to the presence of God and into eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order and a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets and who as yet have not entered in so great a fullness as, though who are, as those who are resurrected from the dead. So I just think it's, it's a very interesting, I think it's important to, to mention in this part of the blessing that not all these blessings are necessarily fulfilled in a lifetime, but it's important to point out that the Lord has prepared President Lorenzo Snow to be that preacher, to be that ministry angel and to other people out there. Oh, definitely. It's there's a lot we don't know about translated beings, but there's a lot we don't necessarily need to know until we're at that point. The Lord's plan is is large and takes into account many things. And I find it interesting that this this is mentioned here and in, and in plen and in quite a few of the other 19th century blessings. Blessings of of this nature were given. So it seems the Lord was really preparing a an elect group of people to to spread the gospel not just not just here but among all uh, among all of his children and wherever else they may be absolutely and talking about about preaching to to people who are scattered out there he receives the power to preach to the spirits in prison and i just think it's interesting here that i brought that he served as the first temple president of the salt lake temple from 1893 until 1898 when he was uh, ordained the president of the church. And while serving as temple president, he made the following statement in the Millennial Star. I believe that when the gospel is preached to the spirits in prison, the success attending that preaching will be far greater than that attending the preaching of our elders in life. I believe there will be very few indeed of those spirits who will not gladly receive the gospel when it is carried to them. The circumstances there will be a thousand times more favorable. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's another literal fulfilling of the blessing. It says that he will preach to the spirits in prison and he served as a temple president, a place where we extend those, those covenants to the, to the spirits who are in prison waiting to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think it's also important to remember that these patriarchal blessings are not meant to be restrained to this life only. And we know that many of the great leaders and many of the priesthood holders of this life have been called in the next, like after they after they pass from this life to preach to those spirits who are in prison in the spirit world, to bring that work to pass. The work we do for redeeming the dead on this side of the veil um, through the temples is only half of the work that needs to be done. There's a lot of work being done on the other side as well, of preaching the gospel to to those who didn't have a chance to find it in this life. Absolutely. And that has been revealed to, to the prophet Joseph F. Smith, right? In Doctrine and Covenants section 138, if I'm not mistaken. He talks yes, about uh, the missionaries on the other side of the veil preaching to the spirits in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have here the next reference. He receives power like Enoch to translate thyself to heaven. And let's take a look at that story on Moses chapter 7. If you have the reference, Reggie. Yeah, just give me a moment. Um, in Moses chapter 7, this is the story of Enoch yeah. and about what, what he means by this trans power of translating to heaven. And so the story of Enoch is as follows. And it came to pass that Enoch continued to call upon all the people, save it were the people of Canaan, to repent. And so great was the faith of Enoch that he led the people of God, and their enemies came to battle against them. And he spake the word of the Lord, and the earth trembled, and the mountains fled even according to his command. And the rivers of water were turned out of their course, and the roar of the lions was heard out of the wilderness. And all nations feared greatly, so powerful was the word of Enoch, and so great was the power of the language which God had given him. 
The fear of the Lord was upon all nations, so great was the glory of the Lord, which was upon his people. And the Lord blessed the land, and they were blessed upon the mountains and upon the high places, and did flourish. And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were of one heart and one mind, and dwelt in righteousness, and there was no poor among them. And Enoch continued his preaching in righteousness unto the people of God. And it came to pass in his days that he built a city that was called the city of holiness, even Zion. And it came to pass that Enoch talked with the Lord, and he said unto the Lord, Surely Zion shall dwell in safety forever. For the Lord said unto Enoch, Zion have I blessed, but the residue of the people have I cursed. And it came to pass that the Lord showed unto Enoch all the inhabitants of the earth. And he beheld, and lo, Zion in process of time was taken up into heaven. And the Lord said unto Enoch, Behold mine abode forever. And so this is the, the story of Enoch, who was a, was a preacher. This was this was shortly before the time of Noah. So if you remember the story of Noah, the people had become very wicked in the earth at the time. And now the most righteous from the people of this antediluvian period, those who were converted by the preaching of Enoch, they had gathered into this city of Zion, where they developed, they, they lived in a righteous society. They were one heart, one mind, no no poor, and the the city to the point where it became where it became like heaven to the extent where it was lifted up out of, out of the earth and went to heaven itself, leaving leaving the rest of the earth wicked enough to prepare for the flood. And so I, I presume when it, when Lorenzo Snow is being blessed with the power like Enoch to translate thyself to heaven, I can't help but think that a portion of this power is not is not so much to be able to go and visit heaven so much as it is to bring heaven to earth, like Enoch to create and develop a city of Zion. Uh, as part as as a definitely a certain uh, a part of that. Amazing! I love that insight. I think it's spot on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Reggie. And now there's this amazing, amazing story. It says, "Thou shalt have the power to rend the veil of heaven and see Jesus standing at the right hand of His Father." And I have here selected this amazing story. If you want to go ahead and read it for us, Reggie. Certainly. After we left his room and were still in the large corridor leading into the celestial room, I was walking several steps ahead of Grandpa, his Grandpa being Lorenzo Snow, when he stopped me and said, Wait a moment, Ali. I want to tell you something. It was right here that the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me at the time of the death of President Woodruff. He instructed me to go right ahead and reorganize the first presidency of the church at once and not wait, as has been done after the death of the previous presidents, and that I was to succeed President Woodruff. Then Grandpa came a step nearer, and he held out his left hand and said he stood right here, about three feet above the floor. It looked as though he stood on a plate of solid gold. Grandpa told me what, look, what a, a glorious personage the Savior is, and described his hands, feet, countenance, and beautiful white robes, all of which were of such a glory of whiteness and brightness that he could hardly gaze upon him. Then he came another step nearer and put his right hand on my head and said, Now, granddaughter, I want you to remember that this is the testimony of your grandfather, that he told you with his own lips that he actually saw the Savior here in the temple and talked with him face to face. And so this is another one of those rare experiences that was shared in which a man was allowed, was allowed to see Jesus Christ. And so to me, this is both a fulfillment of the part of the blessing where it talks about his faith, faith enough to see Christ, and the part of this blessing where he shall see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Yes, thank you very much. Indeed, the very sacred experience that President Snow shared with us. And, and this, was, this happened in the Salt Lake Temple while he was, uh, he was talking to his granddaughter. And just an amazing experience. And the blessing continues. There shall not be a mightier man on earth than thou. Thy faith shall increase and grow stronger and stronger. It shall be like that of Peter. Thy shadow shall restore the sick. The disease shall send to thee their handkerchiefs and aprons. And by thy touch their owners shall be healed. So I have this, um, this amazing story where... Uh, this part of this this blessing of healing is recounted he, this was during his mission in Italy and it says after arriving in Italy Lorenzo Snow struggled to find many converts he boarded with the family of Joseph Gray and began to teach to the people in the town of Piedmont 
Joseph had a three-year-old son that was critically ill. Lorenzo described him as reduced to a skeleton. Lorenzo worried that if the boy died, the people of the town would attribute it to their boarding at the home and destroy any chance of their work. The next morning, Lorenzo planned to go up to a local mountain and pray for the boy to be healed. But as he left, the boy's mom cried out that he had died. Still he left to the mountain. When he returned, the mother reported to the boy he reported the boy had not died, but was still very very ill. The missionaries administered a blessing to the boy. Only hours later his health began to return. That night his parents wept slept for the first time in weeks. Within a few days the boy was entirely healed. So this is just another amazing uh fulfillment of the blessing that he receives this power of healing and he uses the power of healing both to bless the lives of these parents and of this boy and to make sure that the gospel is preached yeah i mean this this reminds me this this concept of the disease sent to the, the handkerchiefs and aprons was a more common thing in the early 19th century and, and it harkens back to even like the stories of christ as in the woman with the issue of blood who went up and touched the robe of jesus christ to be healed which the response of Christ was it was her faith that had made her whole. And this idea of the priesthood being able to bless at a distance, for example, when Jesus Christ, um, I believe this was the, I believe the, there, there, there are examples of miracles of Jesus Christ, I don't want to get this wrong, so I'm just going to say there are, where he would, where he, where he would be able to say the word, and healings and blessings and raisings of the dead could occur often in a dis from a distance. And and while while over time, and I think by this point in Lorenzo's life, it was less less common for the the idea of a piece of cloth being what brings the healing, and more just the power of the priesthood and the faith. This this the same concept of Lorenzo Snow being having this power as Peter had to be able to to heal the sick. This this power of the priesthood and this gift of healing is most certainly fulfilled in this this experience from his mission in Italy. Absolutely. It's a symbolism, right? The handkerchief symbolizes the faith and the touch of the the owners symbolize the power of the priesthood being bestowed by the priesthood bearer unto the person. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I have this next experience here. Thou shalt have the power thou, thou shalt have power over unclean spirits. At thy command the powers of darkness shall stand back, and devils shall flee away. So I have this other uh, experience, if you want to read the, the, that for us. Certainly. So not long after Brother Snow was appointed to preside over the church in London, a circumstance occurred which plainly illustrated the interference of evil spirits in human affairs, and most strikingly their use as instruments to oppose the progress of the latter-day work. At the time referred to, he occupied a well-furnished upper room, and directly after his appointment to the presidency, after retiring to bed at night, he was aroused from sleep by the most discordant noises. It seemed as though every piece of furniture in the room was put in motion, going slash-dash, helter-skelter, back and forth against each other, in such terrible fury that sleep and rest were utter impossibilities. Accordingly, after a day of fasting and before kneeling to pray, as was his custom before retiring for the night, he read aloud a chapter in the Bible, and then, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth and by the authority of the Holy Priesthood, rebuked those spirits and commanded them to leave the house, went to bed, and had no more disturbance. And so this here is again a, a fulfillment of the blessing here where Lorenzo Snow had the opportunity and the blessing to, well I don't know so much a blessing to be to be tormented by these spirits, but so much a blessing to be able to use the priesthood to, to have power over them, to cast them out and such. Absolutely. Thank you, Reggie. And, and the last part that I, that I want to share today is about this experience. And it says, If it be expedient that that shall rise and come forth at thy bidding, even those that have long slept in the dust shall come forth to life. And I have this experience that he relates here. He says, Later in his life, Lorenzo Snow served in Brigham City, Utah. A young woman in his stake, Ella Jensen, had become ill. Lorenzo worried about and prayed for Ella. On the morning of March 1st, 1891, Lorenzo got a message that Ella had died. He went to her home to give his condolences to the family. By the time he arrived, she had already been dead two hours. While there, he felt prompted to ask for consecrated oil. He remembered the promise in his patriarchal blessing 
that if necessary he would have the power to bring people back from the dead, Lorenzo does not administer the blessing to the girl, Ella recounts feeling her spirit leave her body, content that she was going to the spirit world and watching her family weep, and then hearing Lorenzo tell her she must come back, which then she did. This story is recounted in, the, in detail in the magazine Improvement, The Improvement Era, October 1929. It's an amazing story. She was just 20 years old, this lady, and, and this happens to her. And she describes in detail leaving the body and arising to, to the celestial space where she greeted all the people that were in her life before her grandpa. And she talks to all these people. And here, and, and he, he, she recounts hearing the call of presence, no, calling her back to her body, which then she does, and she comes back to life. And she goes on to have, I think, eight children and lives to a ripe old age after that happens. I find it amazing that, that these blessings that were, as we go through the patriarchal blessing here of Lorenzo Snow and all of these amazing and, and like astounding blessings that he's being offered, that he's being given in this blessing. And then, in this case, as we go through his life, we see the fulfillment of so many of these blessings, of all these miracles that he was able to experience and be a part of. Just fills me with awe. Yeah, absolutely. Well... Thank you so much, Reggie, for all your comments and your insights. I really enjoyed watching this, uh, reading this blessing with you and watching the fulfillment of all the promises that have been there. Absolutely all the promises. And many of which which are still to come in the next life, which, which we shall eventually witness. Certainly. And remember that this blessing was given when he was only 22 years old. Before much many of this, before anyone knew what would become of him and where he would go in life, and yet it was all fulfilled. Absolutely, even until the end of his life, right? When he was mm -hmm. eighty something years old, he became the president of the church and many many missions that he served. So it's just amazing to see the the power of the Lord working so eloquently through His servants who are faithful until the end. Yeah. Okay, Reggie, thank you so much. I hope to see you again next week and cover the second part of this blessing. And thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. And so we'll be back, same place, same channel, next week with part two of this blessing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Reggie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.